Well, thank you, Rob and Kate, for those uh, very generous comments. And uh, I think Rob's comment that I'm a sitting duck in is an appropriate one. I'd start today. I'm actually going to make myself, I think, in this presentation into a sitting duck of my own. Is that possible? I, no idea. Uh, let me begin with a, a disclaimer, because oh, I should just say it's great to be back in Australia. I think Sydney is a great... I only know that it's a little downtown bit well at all, but it's a great... I'm having a wonderful time here. We went out to Manly Beach on Monday in the good weather, maybe the first day of spring, but we hit it perfectly. So I'm really enjoying being back in Australia. The first time I've actually talked in Sydney, I've been in Melbourne and in Hobart before, it's, but... I'm covering the states systematically. Maybe in another 10 years, I'll visit, visit it to every part of Australia. Let me begin with a disclaimer. I'm currently living in British Columbia, which, as the license plates on the car tell us, is the best place on earth. So I know this now to be true. And from this lofty and exalted position, when I was asked to talk about placelessness here, I thought this would be a fairly straightforward thing to do. I would be, in the 40 years or so since I was working on place and placelessness, there have probably, probably been several hundred books written about place. I could only come up with three written about placelessness in various ways. I, don't, I haven't been party to Rob's research on this, which is interesting, but there is Josh Merowitz's book on No Sense of Place. There's... Mark O'Shea's work on non-place, and there's a recent book by Yifu Tuan on religion from place to placelessness. That's it. I thought, this is easy. I'm in the best place on earth. This is a quick task for me. It didn't turn out quite like that, because as I began to pursue this, it became clear to me that things are rather more complicated than that. In particular, there have been a number of major transformations that have occurred over the course of the last 40 years. Transformations in the way places are experienced, which mean that the relationship between place and placelessness has changed really quite dramatically. So I am sort of going reinterpreting ideas of place and placelessness. Using these themes, I want to talk particularly about the resurgence of distinctiveness and hybridity and hybrid places, some of these things I'll go through quite quickly. I'm attentive to Kate's standing and sidling. Um, and so I, I going, may have to skip through some of my images fairly quickly. Let me begin with the paradox of place. And that essentially, the, what I mean by that is that place and placelessness, which uh, the, the very phrase implies that it's a dualism. In fact, the paradox is that they are intertwined. And if you read Marc Auger's book on non-places carefully, you'll realize that what he, when he's talking about the uh, airports and clinics and so on, he's very clear that in those non-places, there is always a strong element of place, and he talks about them as opposed polarities. They may be in a sense, opposed to one another, but they are inseparable. My take on that is a little bit different. I'm still the, the idea of intertwining is really important, but my take is a little bit different. This is a dry goods store in Toronto, which I actually, I, I think I may have used an illustration of this in the uh, no, place and placelessness. I can no longer remember. There's no place like this place, any place. That implies uniqueness, but a unique place is, in fact, an impossibility. It would be un incomprehensible. If it was truly unique, we wouldn't be able to make sense of it. Equally, if all everywhere was placeless, the notion of place would be quite irrelevant. You wouldn't, everything is the same. So what I now the way I now think of the re relationship is this, that place is about distinctiveness, and place is such a widely used word. I mean, there are, I think there are four, five or six disciplines involved in the place and people cluster. But I can probably find 20, 25 disciplines that now claim that they are concerned with place in some significant <coughs> way. Almost every discipline, neuroscience, ecology, you can, 
they are all invo involved now with sense of place and issues of place. The one thing that I can find which is characteristic for all those ideas is that place is about something that is distinctive. That's what the, the, Sydney is a distinctive place. Australia is a distinctive place. It doesn't matter what the scale is. It's distinctiveness. It's, it's separate from other places. Conversely, if you have something that is distinctive from, there's a comparative component here. So conversely, if it's distinctive from something, it must be in some way the same as other places. So placelessness is about sameness. What same, how things are same, the same. So we've got place equals distinctiveness, placelessness equals sameness. Now an important corollary to those ideas is that place is not all good. Too much place leads to exclusion, creating outsiders. The nimbyism and the simple case into ethnic cleansing in the more extreme cases. Conversely, sameness and placelessness are not all negative. It's not altogether negative. There's a book by a philosopher, Thomas Nagel, called The View from Nowhere, extolling the virtue of cosmopolitan thinking. Yi Fu Tuan, who is often talked about as one of the authorities writing about place, in fact has been quite explicit that his view of the world is a cosmopolitan one. He's interested in the shared human values. In his book on religion from place to placelessness, the idea is that heaven is, a, is placeless. We've somewhere where you've escaped the drudgery and the burden of particular places, life on earth. So there's a positive comment, uh, co uh, element to placelessness and there's a negative element to place. So these are complex ideas. Simple version of this is that these ideas of place and the relationship, the intertwining of place and placelessness evolves. And, it, and evolution, of course, is not in a particular direction. It's, it's change and adaptation to changing circumstances. So this, this is a, a very simple a comparison of that. Uh, and I'm using old slides. I've, got, I've scanned a lot of old slides. These are from the, uh, the, you see some of the cars in these illustrations. You know, they're, they're wonderful. They're from the 1970s. Um, pre-modern places, in pre-modern places, the relationship between place and placelessness was that distinctiveness was in the ascendant and placelessness was in the background. So they're in this, this is a village on the border of England and Wales. The house here dates from about the 14th century. Some of these up here are from the early 20th century. But there's a kind of continuity of tradition. And the tradition is based on the use of local materials and creating a local style for doing things. The placeless element, the, the spire of the Gothic church pointing to placeless heaven, of course, is interpreted, it's adapted to the local context. So placelessness, of the, the sameness elements are incorporated but are always modified to the local condition. In contrast, in the modernist context, which is really, I'm thinking, in the 1950s to 1950 to 70 period, place becomes suppressed and the placeless elements of asphalt, nobody talks about asphalt very much, but it's a very significant placeless material. The asphalt, the glass, the metal, the street lights, and so on, they are all the, the dominant elements and place is suppressed. That is actually the center of Milton Keynes, the new town in Britain, and I love the fact that it's I may have to be corrected on this, but my recollection is that this street is called Midsummer Drive. <laughs> Ironies galore. So that was, that's a simple contrast. My interpretation of placelessness and how it arose and how it became the dominant element is that it began really with with rational philosophy in the 17th century, with Descartes and with 
uh, Newton and that sort of rationalist objective approach to things. It got interpreted through the Industrial Revolution and the mass production. Then it was given an aesthetic form by the modernist architects of the Bauhaus and the Le Corbusier and so on. But it didn't really get manifest in landscapes to any great extent until after the Second World War. And this is a heroic planner from, I think it's the Othwat report, uh, for the reconstruction of London after the Second World War, done in 1944, 1945, around about then, wiping the slate clean. The idea was, that I'm trying to convey with this, is that in the context of two world wars, which, in which millions of people had been killed, it was pretty darn clear that the old ways of doing things no longer worked well. They were destructive. A new way of doing things was needed, and modernism provided that new way. It was the new way. Do things differently. It couldn't be any worse than what had preceded it. Let's start over. And so you got very quickly in the 1950s and 60s the assertion of modernist approaches. I've just used, uh, this is all the place and placelessness stuff that Rob summarized just now very nicely. But this gives an idea of the, the essential qualities of this. Same, well, th this diagram here is from Gropius. It's one of his little theoretical planning diagrams showing the spacing of apartment buildings so that the sunlight can get down to them uh, further apart, the taller they are, and so on. And it led to these serried ranks of little slab apartment buildings in Moscow, in Toronto, all over the world, actually. This is Cabrini Green in Chicago some years ago. What this indicates is one of the clear aspects of modernist approaches. Get rid of everything old. The old ways hadn't worked clean in. The, so you get these sort of tiny elements of what was old left. But for the most part, placeless development in the 1950s and 60s simply obliterated what was there before. Remade road patterns, street patterns, got rid of the old buildings. The old stuff was worthless. What they wanted was uniformity and efficiency because those were the good placeless qualities that they were striving for. To cut this story... Make, to make this story brief, what the situation was by about 1970, when I was beginning to develop those ideas of place and placelessness, was that the, there were really a contrasting in landscapes. The difference between old places and new placelessness was manifest. I, I wasn't making this up. You could walk around and see it. So, and it wasn't that you had to look way back for the place evidence. Anything built before about 1940 seemed to have a distinctive quality, which was lacking in the new stuff. So this is your late 19th <coughs> century undistinguished housing in Toronto. This was the 1950s version of it. Little rank, all your little boxes. Down here, the commercial landscape from the 19th century, sort of small town main street, a variety of, of types of stores, different buildings at different scales, all had character and personality, the new commercial strips, which could be in pretty much everywhere. That one is actually at Houston or Dallas or somewhere in the southern states in the 1970s, late 70s. The contrast was real. Now, on reflection, when I go back to this, I'm one thing, I, I actually was, I shouldn't praise myself like this, but I think it was quite accurate in representing the way things were, and I sort of tied in all the philosophy and phenomenology, and that made it into a PhD and satisfied my supervisor and all that sort of stuff. Well, it's more complicated than that, but there's an element of that. What I missed, in retrospect, what I missed when I was writing that book was that there was already a change underway, that the resistant, there was a resistance to placelessness already developing. It actually, you can see it in Jane Jacobs' writing. When she began, she contrasted, uh, uh, her Death and Life is a 
critique of modernist planning and the, what she called the desegregated sortings of modernist planning. And she was writing in praise of the organized complexity of the old parts of cities. When she was writing about that, others, Peter Blake and Ian Nairn and so on, were also offering similar sorts of criticisms. I missed that. And it wasn't, in fact, until right at the end of the, the 1960s, around about 1970, that those sorts of critiques began to manifest themselves in changed landscapes. And it began, uh, it probably had local variations on this, but it certainly began in the context of all the protests in the late 1960s about civil rights and anti-war movements and against environmental degradation and so on. In the co context, there were protests about modernist development, particularly in the Toronto case, in San Francisco, New York, and so on, protests against expressway construction. So this is Stop the Spadina Expressway in Toronto, where Jane Jacobs just moved, and she got actively involved in that. And it was to protect this residential areas from this expressway, which was going to be driven right through them into the heart of downtown. So there's the evidence of resistance. It was successful. The expressways were stopped. That was like the, the first skirmish in what I think was a movement that is continuing right up to the present day. More significant than that protest movement was the rise of heritage. There were also protests to protect old buildings from destruction because the modernist developers were just taking down the old stuff. It was obsolete, useless. So you got the first intimations of heritage protection, which came into focus in that 1972 UNESCO Convention for the Protection of Cultural and Natural Heritage, which I think was probably a huge turning point because that took all these protest movements about heritage and the concerns about heritage and brought people from around the world into a context where they could discuss this. And one of the recommendations of that convention was that every nation participating should pass heritage legislation. This is hard to, to think back to now. In 1962, a decade before that, the notion of heritage didn't exist. Heritage meant, you know, the queen had heritage. There was something like that. Heritage protection didn't exist. Now it is so absolutely fundamental to planning and urban development and design, we take it for granted. So there was a huge, uh, it's a huge change in thinking. Once that had happened, that was kind of a turning point. And then people started to think about distinctiveness and doing things differently, way, m moving away from the modernist box architecture, postmodern architecture. This is in a uh, uh, suburban city just outside Toronto, the, the, the new modern postmodern city hall from the 1980s, designed to reflect the elements of the farms which had stood on the site of this rapidly expanding suburban area. This is the, the water tower or windmill. The office block in the back here would be the barn. This piece at the front is meant to be the farmhouse. And the, there's a drum here, which is actually the, the, no, the council chamber, what was captured the form of the, the, the grain silos that they used. Got postmodern architecture came into use. A few years later, the neo-traditional, uh, the terminology is interesting here, the neo-traditional planners, this is Seaside, uh, and the idea in Seaside was to echo the vernacular architecture of Florida. So these weird towers uh, are actually uh, sort of a quotation of the, the devices used on some of the small old wooden houses in Florida to capture breezes in the evening to provide improved ventilation. So it's sort of picking up on, on the vernacular. But this is the, the one phrase which seems to capture the change to me more effectively than anything else. Up on the top right is Andres Duany shaking hands with Larry Lee, who's a new urbanist developer in Toronto. 
I have seen the future and it is the past is exactly opposite to the modernist credo, which was I have seen the future and it has nothing to do with the past. That actually flipped it right over. So this is a distinctiveness beginning to be implemented on a relatively small scale, but the trend was established and it was happened at about the same time in the most unlikely of contexts, which was big business, the corporate sector. I used to take photos of McDonald's in order to capture their essential sameness wherever I went. Around about 1980, you began to get this sort of thing. This is in Bruges in Belgium from the night. The fashions may give it away, but it really was about, about 1980, 81. And they began to diversify, to go into old buildings, to adapt to context. Suburban development developers, that's in New England about the same time. A new suburban development, not done in the little box style, but reflecting the regional architecture. This is, I took this slide when I was invited by Kim Dovey to a conference on placemaking in Melbourne. This was in Melbourne Air City Airport. Turns most places into capital cities. That it captures very neatly what was happening in the world of big business. In the 1980s, they began to recognize that location was not just a, a matter of economics, it was about quality of place. And the Economist Intelligence Unit and Mercer surveys of place quality began in the 1980s when they realized that quality of place was a strategic business asset. You've got the, so at the corporate financial investment side, you have this sort of thinking. On the municipal side, the response to that was place marketing and place branding, and all of which works only as well as the reality behind it. So in fact, when you've got place branding, this, this is somewhere just outside Toronto, but did see the I love New York sort of thing. That only works as well as the reality behind it. So in order, the, the, the municipalities had to begin to live up to their brand image. So they began making improvements to, set, to destination architecture and those sorts of things to increase the distinctiveness of, of their, their cities. So by the 19... 90s, when you get Howard Kunstler wrote a book called The Geography of Nowhere in 1993 or 4 or something like that, which was a rant against urban sprawl in the United States. He, I mean, there was, still, there was still that sort of placeless development happening, but in fact the reality, I think, had really turned around. There was a great deal less nowhere in the 1990s than there had been in about 1970. This is a gay village in Toronto. That would have been unthinkable. Homosexuality was a crime in the 1960s. And this, the scale of these changes, was uh, looking back on them, is phenomenal. This is the Docklands in London around about 2000. I can't remember when I was exactly there. That was uh, the, an old 19th century industrial area, really drab, sort of uniform buildings, deeply polluted. When I was a student in London in the 1960s, the Thames was, there had been no fish in the Thames for the previous 200 years. By 1990, they had trout and salmon back. <coughs> These are huge changes which were occurred, which tend to get lost, I think, in a lot of interpretations. And this down here, I've, this is uh, Mark O'Shea writing about non-places in the, right at the end of that decade. Uh, this is, the, the, even there there was a change, and his, I, his thing about place and non-place being opposed polarities, even in the non-places of airports, you now begin to see a, a, a attempts to acknowledge the distinctiveness of the place. This is in Vancouver Airport, and this is a, a First Nations installation reflecting the local character. When, so you can see the, the, the shifts underway. Now, there was a resurgence then of distinctiveness 
in some way, but it wasn't just a revival of pre-modern ways of making places. This happened in the context of a whole series of social and technological transformations and philosophical ones captured here. I mean, this is just, you, it's hard to get images for this sort of stuff. You have to be really quite selective and it's almost, you really need a video because a lot of it's spread out, but once in a while you get them. Um, this is just a little bit of a street scene. You know, all the, the cell phone aerials up here, the repeaters up there. And then this is, Tilly is an adventure clothing company, the bucket list, collecting the, bu making up a bucket list of places. I haven't been everywhere, but I'm trying. Mobility, it becomes really important. So you have a whole series of transformations, the most fundamental of which was an epistemological one. I think for me, the most fundamental one. Uh, the, the, Rob mentioned uh, the importance of positivism in placelessness. That has been pushed into the background. This is a, a, a sculpture from the 1920s called Spirit of the Time. It's sort of a sculpture which represents positivism, a mannequin's characterless head with these measuring devices, listening devices, measuring cups and so on. That's a ruler on the side. Has been fading into the background because really deep, philosophical changes which have, in the words of one philosopher of science, Stephen Toulmin, there has been a collapse in the idea of rationalism over the previous three decades. And almost anything you read, Heidegger was part of that, Wittgenstein was part of it, Foucault, you, Leo Tar, you, Richard Rorty, you can rhyme them off. There's hardly a philosopher left who will hold to a, a hardline rationalist position. The privileged view of scientific objectivity has been fading away. It's been it sort of now very, the assumptions are very weak. And as those have faded, so diversity has come, become more prominent. Accompanied, so that philosophical transformation is underlying almost everything Associated with that, we get mobility, which used to be one of the marks of placelessness, is now a way of creating multi-place experiences. Diagram up in the top right is of air routes. At any given moment, there are about half a million people in the air. And that's going to be increasing because every airport in the major airport in the world is trying to expand. I had a photo in Place and Placelessness of the, I think, of the authenticity of, of Florence. Well, here you are, people on the other side of the Arno, contemplating the authenticity of Florence. Now, traveling hundreds of tourists, the that went behind them were all the tour buses. In Seaside, one of the houses in Seaside, little sign outside it, it says, Crystal Blue Persuasion, Lewis and Becky Portera from Dallas, Texas. This is a second home. Multiple place experiences, multi-centered experiences are now the standard for a lot of people. I actually own property in three different countries on two different continents. I am not exceptional in this in any way. Almost everybody I meet has lived in various places for several years. and So multi-centered experiences are important. Reinforcing that is the, mass, the great migration. I think that's Edward Said's phrase. The great migrations of the late 20th century, people moving between continents in the hundreds of thousands. Toronto might be exceptional because half the population is now foreign born. Diversity is taken for granted there, but it's true of every world city. And the consequences of that are these sorts of of changes to landscapes. You, again, you capture this in little bits. The whole landscape doesn't change, but you see evidence of the changed experience in small things. New culture superimposed onto the old culture, the Horton, bu Horton Building at the corner of Shepherd and Kennedy Roads. You know, all those Anglo names, no, displaced. The Toronto Transit Commission, working in over 70 languages. That's Leonis Sandikok's notion of cosmopolis. I like this one. I've, made, I've used this in other conference presentations. This is one sign in Toronto. No, unfortunately disappeared. It should have been heritage designated. 
Caribbean food supermercado hispano specializing in African, Canadian, East and West Indian, Newfoundland, <laughs> and Spanish foods. What does the word specializing mean here? I have no idea, but it, this, I, this juxtaposition, Foucault's term for it would be heterotopia. All these things out of place, juxtaposed without rhyme or reason. Look at all the language here. These are multiculturalism, transnationalism. These are the languages we use to describe what's going on in the world. Disembedding means that social, that's uh, Anthony Giddens' term for the fact that social relations have been moved out of their local contexts. And that's what's happened here. They've been shipped, or uh, Geertz's term is what happens when reality is shipped around the world. And that's reinforcing that sort of multicultural hybridity, cosmopolis, heterotopic view of things, everything to do with the global economy. Space-time compression symbolized here. This is a, a foreign investment company in their office window. They have the, the iconic elements of uh, New York and London and Beijing and Paris and so on, all compressed. Space-time compression. The world has been shrunk. Uh, I have to use this slide because it's so wonderful. This is on one of the expressways in Toronto when the G20 met there. Expect significant delays. Actually, what we got was, uh, and should have expected, was a suspension of civil liberties because this comes with a whole neoliberal package. Uh, they actually, if you moved in the wrong part of the city, you could be arrested just for being there for a few days. That was the idea of security. And, and this sort of global economic process happens at a local, small business level. It's not just big business. You go into the... the new the ethnic enclaves in any city and you'll see the business signs up they're working between several countries that is also these transformations the economic and social and philosophical ones further reinforced and i don't know the relationships between all these things they're happening together they still are going on but telecommunications reinforcing and contributing to all these other changes everywhere. The idea of the global village is of course the notion, McLuhan's idea, that the electronic communications whip around the world at the speed of light and have turned everything back in on itself. So it's not a nice, it's often used as a kind of uh, advertising idea. In fact it's a nasty idea. It's a, a, as much as a good Good thing. The global village means we're subject to all this electronic gossip. And so we have been turned into a village. Things are mixed up. Things are hybridized. So I think hybridity is the key to a lot of what is happening. And hybridity is not a terribly good word, but I don't have a better one. But the way things are now mixed together, the way in which we, people experience places, move around, and it's not necessarily obvious. This is a, an interesting building to me. Uh, it's in the Middle Eastern part of Toronto. It's a building from the 1960s, so it's a sort of a classic placeless type of modernist probably just got elevators in it, but only just building without any great character. It is, in fact, occupied by a large, I, the, I, the, I know this because the person uh, who told me about it was familiar, had been inside and was familiar with the residents. So it's largely a Middle Eastern Arab population. Every balcony has at least one satellite dish on it. Her version of it was that at least one of those satellite dishes on every balcony is trained to Al Jazeera. So they're creating a place in Toronto in a placeless environment which is connected out to other parts of the world. This is just for the context across the street. There's McDonald's and there's the new mosque. 
Yeah, the juxtapositions here. What this involves, and Anthony Giddens talked about disembedding and the way social relations have been lifted out of local contexts. This is a form of re-embedding, which he doesn't write about. And what is happening, I think, in a lot of these hybrid and places is that there's a re-embedding which, in which placeless elements and place elements are combined. People are creating new places for themselves using things which would conventionally be considered placeless. Here's another example on the, uh, from another perspective entirely. Kawachan Bay is a little coastal village, resort village on, the, on Vancouver Island. It is the first registered, authenticated, if you like, Chita Slo community in North America. The Chita Slo movement was the one, the slow food movement that started in northern Italy in 1999, and they're now registering this local identity around the world. So localism is in fact a global movement. Nothing now in terms of place or placelessness comes clean. The intertwining, the opposed polarities are always mixed up. And my last slide before you get up, Kate. I'll, I'll just put this into a placemaking context. Uh, placemaking is a really difficult idea because it, it actually, placemaking is about people making something for themselves out of their bit of the world. But it's been co-opted by designers in particular as a way of building these sorts of um, nice pedestrian friendly <coughs> small urban spaces. Um, this could have create an urban place. <clears throat> well, this is the Project for Public Spaces is the American organization which is, claims to be the leader in the placemaking movement in the United States. And on its website, that is actually a clip up there the, from their website. It's the central hub of the global placemaking movement. Do you have to be able to live nowadays with what are apparent obvious contradictions? In terms of placemaking, what is happening in these sorts of contexts when the designers work with notions of accessibility and walkability and sustainability is that they are actually using placeless ideas, ideas and approaches which are transportable, can be used anywhere in the world, to make somewhere which is distinctive in this new integrated <coughs> sense of uh, the, the hybrid place placelessness relationship. So I think the place and placelessness have evolved together and have become intertwined in really complicated ways which are very difficult to unravel. I can't claim to understand most of it. I'm merely observing it is difficult because it, I'm, I've tried to get photographs which capture it in one, one image. But in fact, in many cases, it, you only see this thing as you, as you drive around and move around. My final observation about this is that the, it comes from a Welsh politician uh, way back when, but the, it's this, that the words place and placelessness remain the same. So we can still use them, but the reality about behind them has changed fundamentally. So we have to be really cautious about how these terms are used now. It, nothing is obvious anymore. Thank you, Kate. Thank you.